You know, this final session of the symposium will focus on some of the vast changes that America experienced after the war, you know, particularly uh, in American society. And chair of this session, it's my honor and, and a distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Steph Hinterschitz. Uh, Steph received her PhD from the University of Maryland and has held uh, posts at uh, universities uh, before she joined the museum in 2021 of note I, uh, to include the United States Military Academy at West Point, the old Department of History. But uh, you know, working, Steph's worked on our leadership initiative, our travel. She's contributed to our articles, public programs, and uh, it, it was a privilege to have her promoted to senior historian while she was here in the Institute. Um, you know, sadly, she's, she's moved on and, and uh, uh, joined the team at Maxwell Air Force Base, uh, where she's now with the Air Command Staff College uh, as she goes forward. But some of you remember our 2021 conference. Uh, Steph presented her, her latest book, uh, Japanese American Incarceration, and uh, was really instrumental uh, in, uh, in our behind the scenes effort to, uh, to, to complete and to integrate Liberation Pavilion. You know, as you take all those galleries and the themes and the messages uh, and really try to make relevance of you know, how the war changed America uh, in addition to America's role in the world. So you know, certainly uh, we're sad to see Steph uh, move up to Maxwell, um, but you know, as always, uh, we're proud of that, and we're proud to have her part of our, our network of alumni, graduates, historians, and interested folks. Uh, but with that, we're going to turn it over, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to our final session uh, for the pre-conference symposium, Dr. Steph Hinnerschitz. Thanks, Steph. Thank you, Mike. So I will also start off with the Boyer. Uh, I have not had the opportunity to say this yet, so I'm very actually excited. What I say, the views that I express, don't, they do not represent the Air Force, the DOD, <laughs> <laughs> all of that. Yay! I've been waiting to say that, so I got the opportunity to say it. But thank you all for being here this afternoon, and we are the last panel, so I will be mindful of that and what is what is happening later on with the reception, so we will run a tight ship, but it will be very interesting. And I'm sure you may have noticed if you've had the opportunity to walk through the new Liberation Pavilion yet, but if you have not, you will. And this symposium, the way it has been set up, it really does follow the layout of that pavilion. It's almost as if we planned it that way. So what we saw this morning were some of the Things that happened after the war with America's role in the world, so the Nuremberg trials, and then we got into some elements of that later on as well throughout this morning. But what we do is we bring it back this afternoon to the United States, and we look domestically at what kind of responsibilities did America have here at home. So the Liberation Pavilion is really based around this idea of the four freedoms and what they meant before and during the war. But also America has to do a little bit of soul searching after the war with how we are going to address some issues that still remain even after we fought this war against fascism abroad. But what do we have to do here domestically to live up to those promises? So I am very excited about our panelists that we have here today. I won't really go into the bios in depth because they're very long, because our, <laughs> we're all very accomplished historians here. But we do have three very accomplished military and public historians who will get at something that I'm going to call out my old bosses boss when I was here. So Colonel Pete will always tell us if we ever wanted to look at some bigger theme, he always said, where's the World War II in this? So don't forget where World War II. What kind of impact did the war have on some of these bigger changes after the war, especially with the civil rights movement? So with that, I will be quiet because you did not come here to listen to me. You came to listen to our panelists. And I will turn it over to Dr. Marcus Cox. Yep. First time. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Steph. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, this is the last <coughs> session, so um, we don't want to keep you from the food and drink and fellowship. Uh, but um, I'm really excited about this panel, and I think, and I want to um, commend the organizers. You know, the last panel on the New World Order was, was phenomenal. 
uh, and it fits so well into what we're going to talk about in terms of sort of drilling down a little deeper in terms of social change and the impact of World War II. Um, I, don't, I no longer um, teach a lot in the classroom, uh, very rarely, but when I did, I used to always tell my students, which was really interesting, about how important World War II um, was to the United States, um, but in particular, the, um, 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 the black community. Um, I would often say that, um, you know, most all of the social movements of the 1960s all came out of World War II, uh, the political, social, and economic changes that took place. Um, in particular, um, the civil rights movement. Um, so um, I'll t start off by just telling you a little bit about myself and sort of move into um, uh, GIs, uh, foot soldiers, and, and, this, and as civil rights activists. <clears throat> I didn't serve in the military, um, but my grandfather, um, Matthew Trahan, uh, he was in the United States Army. Uh, he was enlisted in 1941. Um, he was from uh, Rain, Louisiana, which is outside of Lafayette, the Crowley area for people in Louisiana. Um, he uh, graduated from um, high school and was working in a sawmill in 1940 when the war started. Um, he decided to enlist into, in the war, and like many African Americans, um, a lot of the, the motivation was to support the family. Of course, you were just coming out of the Great Depression. There are not a lot of jobs and opportunities for African Americans, and the mili military service was, was, was a job. It was, uh, it was, it was uh, salary, it was clothing, it was food, and like most GIs or, or, or soldiers at that time, they would take their earnings and they would send it home to their families, who were probably in dire need. Well, my grandfather, uh, he did that. He um, served in the uh, U.S. military. He was out in the South Pacific for uh, much of the, um, uh, the, the World War II. Um, and then um, afterwards, he served in the military till 1972. So he served 30 years. Um, my grandmother, my, grand, my mother was a military brat. Um, they lived in France. They lived in Germany. Um, my, my older brother and myself was born at Fort Bliss, Texas. Uh, my sister was born at Fort Rucker, Alabama, uh, and so my grandfather um, was a military man, and, and even after he retired, he, he maintained that structure, that discipline, and also helped him start uh, numerous businesses. But uh, so as I was growing up, I had a healthy respect for the military and knew that it had a positive influence, at least on, on my, my family. One of the things that I used to <clears throat> be impressed with is when he would return home and, um, and go back to uh, uh, Opelousas, Louisiana, um, and reign. Uh, his uh, brother and sister-in-laws and family would always, you know, sarge this, sarge that, and, and, and ask him to tell, him, tell them about the places he's been, things that he was able to do in the military. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think, you know, as, a, as an African American in the 1930s and 40s, and by the 1950s, my, my grandmother and my grandfather and my mother lived in Germany in a three-story house, and they had a white maid. And that, of course, obviously was, was unheard of from somebody from a rural part of Louisiana, an African American. Um, so, so the military afforded uh, not only um, him, my, my, my grandfather, to travel around the world and see things, um, but it had a tremendous impact economically, financially, or on the family. He was able to put his siblings through college. Um, uh, one sister graduated from Grambling State University. She became a school teach, st a teacher. Another sister he put through college at Southern University. She became a school teacher. Um, and then, of course, my mother and all of us went to college. So, um, again, th that the connection between military service and the personal uh, uplift of our family was always really, really important. But I often would wonder, and I would talk, ask my grandfather and, and try to have conversations at least about why would African Americans fight for the right to fight? It didn't make any sense to me. Um, during the 1930s, 40s, you know, or even during the 50s, African Americans are second-class citizens. Um, not only do they, they don't have the right to, uh, to vote, um, they're still being lynched um, and being attacked. Um, and so as, as I, like I said, I never uh, was in the military, but as I um, decided to get my PhD in, uh, in Northwestern um, in history, I started to wonder what, what I sh should, I, should I do my dissertation on? And so I decided to, uh, to do my dissertation on African American attitudes toward military service. Again, why would African Americans uh, throughout history fight for the right to fight? 
it didn't make sense to me. And, uh, and like Judge Judy always says, if it doesn't make sense, it's probably not true. <laughs> but in this case, it was true. Um, there was a, a, a strong historical effort of African Americans and ethnic minorities in this country who've always fought for the right to fight. So as I was doing my research, um, there were three to four themes that I found that were very, very important and, and really answered my questions. Number one, military service has always been connected to uh, citizenship rights uh, and social status in terms of political rights in this particular country. And not even just in the United States, but also in Europe. And you can trace it all the way back to the ancient Romans and the Greeks. If you were a citizen, then you were expected to serve in the military. And if you was in the military, then you was expected to have citizenship rights. So think about it from the standpoint of, of a, a marginalized, hyphenated American who is a second-class citizen in this country. If, they, if you want to have citizenship rights, at least one of the stronger pathways to doing that is through military service. Uh, now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the military, um, you won't experience the same things you experience in civil society, um, because we all know that the military is a microcosm of, of society, and therefore, anything that's happening in society, you will see in the military. But politically, uh, that was always a pursuit. The other thing that, that uh, I found out through my research was that military service for men, historically, um, has always been connected to definitions of manhood and masculinity. Defin and so, uh, as African Americans in the antebellum period and as slaves, uh, most often that they were feminized and routinely um, described as being the children. And that was primarily because they were considered to be dependents. Um, so historically, in terms of gender definitions and roles, a man is someone who does X, Y, and Z. Um, they're not a dependent. Um, they protect, they, they serve, they do all these things. But we know that uh, uh, slaves were not able to do that. Um, and therefore, they were not, they were either feminized or they were considered to be lesser than a man. Uh, um, that's where the whole, whole uh, term um, calling a, a black male a boy comes from, because he's not a man, he's a boy. And so military service was a way to, to reflect those manly virtues um, of being a protector, of being someone who, who can defend. Um, and, um, and then also uh, th there's a connection between their social uh, status in the community. The next thing that I, I found that was really interesting was um, that I didn't know that throughout much of um, American history, military service for African Americans, there was a connection between educational opportunities. So during the Civil War, when, when, when slaves would, 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 would sort of run into um, Union camps, in a lot of those camps, even though it was not official or wasn't sanctioned, many of those camps, US colored troops, regiments, had a, a, a school within there where they had individuals that taught the slaves how to read and write. And so um, throughout the, the, the Civil War, most, all, most of the, U, uh, the United States Colored Troop regiments all had um, unofficial schools within those regiments where they went into the, that unit um, not knowing how to read and write. And by the time they finished their service, they were at least had enough education to be able to function in society. Um, after the, the Civil War, you have a lot of uh, historically black colleges and universities that were established by former Union soldiers, African Americans, because they wanted to also promote education and literacy um, for, for African Americans, but also it, it, it gave them economic opportunities as well. Um, you, you see the same thing as you go throughout uh, uh, World War I and then even World War II, but then when you think about the GI Bill, and even though we can all pretty much agree that the GI Bill was not evenly applied to African Americans, there were a lot of African Americans who did benefit from the GI Bill. And I remember as I was doing my research, I was talking to quite a few veterans, and they would tell me how after they left the military, they either went to college, many of them uh, historically black colleges and universities, but, or a lot of them end up going to trade school. Uh, 
at, at a, my former barber, who was an older gentleman back in Baton Rouge, um, told me how he used the GI Bill to get his barber's license. Ultimately, he ended up opening up like five or six barber shops throughout uh, Baton Rouge and did well at, uh, uh, financially. So again, educational opportunities was also closely allied and are connected with military service. Um, and this is not just for African Americans. This was for all, most soldiers. But certainly, this was a very um, pivotal um, opportunity for African Americans who did not have these opportunities in civilian society. And then, of course, we can talk about the economic opportunity of serving in the military. Not only can you use your money to sort of help your families, but also after, again, World War II, you have African Americans who were able, in some cases, not all, being able to get loans to start businesses and to do other things. So military service for African Americans have always been um, very, very unique. Um, and it's not just African Americans also. As I was doing my research, I realized that uh, in the Civil War, many Irish Americans were benefiting from military service in the same way. Because at the beginning of the Civil War, Irish Americans were not considered to be white. Um, they were ethnic um, Europeans, and they were pretty much looked down on in many places throughout the country. And so it was also a way to legitimize their place in American society. Um, so as you look at military service in particular to, um, to um, ethnic or racial minorities, that pathway is, is very different than it, had, it was for, 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 for white Americans. Um, for citizenship, educational opportunities, definitions of manhood, and also economic opportunity. And so for me, um, military service uh, um, was, is starting to sort of come into to focus in terms of why African Americans fought for the right to fight. Um, as I was doing my research and I started, you know, and I just want to highlight a couple of other things, military institutions and service have long been linked to citizenship and manhood. Uh, in times of war, but, but in particular in times of peace, manhood, uh, manpower policies may constitute a strong signal of how the state would respond to minority uh, citizens. And so, uh, again, how African Americans are being treated in civilian society, there's also that, that duplication in the military. Um, and so when, you, when um, I think in particular of, of African Americans um, serving in, in, uh, in the military, and in, in, in particular during the interwar years between the 1920s and the 1940s, um, there was a study that came out in the uh, Army War College about how to utilize uh, uh, Negro manpower or African American soldiers. And, and that particular uh, report um, um, it, it was pretty much the standard of most uh, military officers as they used in terms of how they felt and thought about using black soldiers. So by 1940, when the war starts, as most people know, that mi the military pushed back very hard about in not only integrating the military, but even using African Americans as combat soldiers. Much of those decisions was based on um, that particular report. And that, that report was very damning, to say the least. Uh, it was completely full of uh, racial and negative stereotypes. Um, that refer to African Americans as being not only intellectually inferior, but cowardly um, and, uh, uh, and, and, in, and corrupt in many, many ways. So when the war starts in 1940, again, you have African American leaders who are lobbying the, Ro the Roosevelt administration and also working with Eleanor Roosevelt to try to not only either integrate the military, but even just allow African Americans to serve in combat roles. Um, uh, uh, if, I, if I go back just a little bit to the 18th century, just to sort of put the final point on, um, on, on military service and what it meant um, to society, you have uh, the German philosopher Hegel who once said that the ultimate expression of an individual's recognition uh, of his membership in the ethical community is military service. And so again, that's that's mainly the reason why African Americans are, are fighting for the right to fight. Uh, is this working? I thought it was the good thing. As I said, okay, cool, thank you. Thank you. Good, all right. 
So and this particular slide just sort of highlights some of the things that I was saying. But I want to call your attention to the, to the, to the, the picture there. Um, you, you have a, a, it looks like a British soldier, African American in a British uniform with the Union Jack behind him. Um, and what's significant about that picture is that um, it reflects an African American who's serving in the British Army during the American Revolution. Most people may not realize that um, African Americans started serving uh, for, uh, uh, with the British Army during the American Revolution before they were allowed to serve in the Continental Army. Um, and, and the reason why was because of a couple of reasons. The, the British had decided that they were, gonna, uh, they were going to recruit African Americans and, and slaves to the unions, to the, to the British side, in order to undermine the ability to, um, to uh, 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 defeat the, um, the, uh, the Continental Army. But only then did, did, did the Continental Army start to utilize uh, African Americans. I have a few more slides here. Here we go. So before I, before I end, I want to highlight a couple of individuals who was, who was key um, um, leaders in the civil rights movement. And these are all um, African American um, uh, World War II veterans. First, you have Amazi Moore, who's a large picture there. Amazi Moore was a, a, a member of the NAACP in, in, uh, in, uh, in the 19, um, four, late 40s. Um, in Mississippi, Cleveland, Mississippi. He was the leader of the voter registration um, um, uh, drives and also an advisor to the student nonviolent uh, uh, committee. Um, and he was um, a, uh, a member of uh, the um, uh, uh, port battalion in um, uh, at the invasion of Normandy. At the very bottom, you have uh, Mr. Bill Saunders to the right hand. He was a Korean War veteran, and he was also the organizer of the 1969 Charleston um, hospital strike um, that um, supported um, rights for African American employees. At the very top, you have Medgar Evers. Medgar Evers was also in the NAACP in, in Mississippi, and he was also a World War II veteran. And at the bottom, you have Hoseas Williams, who was a member of the 761st Tank Battalion and the, uh, uh, Patton's Third Army. Um, he was uh, wounded three times during the Battle of the Bulge. Um, and after he came back to the United States, um, he decided that he was going to devote his life to fighting for equal rights and social justice for African Americans. At the very top, you have uh, Walter Green. Walter Green was a member of the, uh, uh, the Michigan Civil Rights Commission. Um, he also served in the South Pacific during World War II, and he became very active in civil rights um, and activism in, uh, in Michigan uh, during the post-war period. Um, he was also uh, um, an individual that uh, went through OCS, and he retired as a major in the 1960s. And at the very bottom, you have a picture of uh, uh, Ernest Chili Willie, who was the founder of the Deacons for Defense, which, which is an African American veterans organization that protected the civil rights uh, marchers and protesters throughout Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. Here you have uh, Robert F. Williams. He um, was also a Korean War veteran in the 1950s. He was a Marine. Um, and he was an active proponent of civil uh, uh, self-defense activism. Self-defense act self activism was a little different, well, uh, quite a bit different than the nonviolent um, uh, civil rights movement in that um, his philosophy was that he was going to, he had the right as an American to protect himself from being attacked. Um, and so he and mil military veterans would often patrol and protect of the black community from, from the Ku Klux Klan and other um, attacks. Uh, he was an individual that was um, uh, from Monroe County, North Carolina. And uh, these last two individuals, um, the one at the top in the right in the red jacket is Dr. Robert Brown. He was also at the D-Day invasion in Normandy. Um, and he returned back to the, uh, Alabama and became a, um, a civil rights activist uh, and also the first African-American superintendent in the state of Alabama. 
Uh, and at the very bottom to the right is uh, Johnny A. Jones, who uh, was a, uh, came back from the United States. He was also at the uh, D-Day invasion um, and uh, 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 engineering battalion. Um, and he came back and became um, a staunch supporter of civil rights, but was also the, one of the attorneys for the Baton Rouge bus boycott. So I, I will end by just saying that many of these individuals who served in, in World War II, um, they came back to the United States fully uh, excited and charged with fighting for social justice and equal rights. That long history of citizenship, um, um, equal opportunity, and, and, and African Americans fighting for those, those, those causes are, you see throughout um, not only United American history, but certainly after World War II as they came back and confronted uh, social injustice in their communities. Thank you. So we'll turn it over to Dr. Rula next. Sorry, technical difficulties already. It's a yeah. great start for the day. Going the wrong direction here. Um, I'll say it's, it's really <laughs> nice. Okay. No, we're just supposed to be going backwards. Oh, there we go. We're almost there. There, there we go. OK, <laughs> thank you. Sorry. It's nice to be at the museum, as always, just to see some familiar faces, meet some new friends. Um, and so I'll just get started. Um, historians have debated for years that how World War II shaped women's lives in the post-war era. The war op opened many doors for women, but were those changes only for the duration, or did they have longer lasting repercussions? And they're complex questions, and they have complex answers. World War II did open doors, and it fundamentally changed women's lives and opportunities, but those changes came in the face of great resistance on the part of many Americans who, even with the demands of war, did not want women moving into new roles. And so women fought against this resistance. They pushed open doors in the home, in the workplace, in the military, and they fought fiercely for these changes. And as the war came to a close, many Americans wanted all of those changes to retract. They wanted all of the doors to close and for women to shift into a new life of domestic bliss. Many doors did close, but not all of them, and not entirely. The war didn't spark this kind of permanent, immediate cultural changes that you can see in other aspects of American society for women. Um, Post-war changes for women were more personal. They were changes in attitudes and an expansion of how women understood their own capacities. Women of the World War II generation planted the seeds that bloomed in the next generation of women who marched and fought and advocated for permanent changes in women's lives in the home, the workplace, and the military. So today I'd like to look at three specific women, each of whom played a role in World War II in their own ways. There are only three among millions of women, but I think their lives embody the kind of nuances and complications that the war had for women in the post-war era. Now, for Americans who deployed overseas, um, and even for those stationed far from home, home was what the war was about, right? Home was when you asked American servicemen and women, why are you fighting? They said to fight to get home, right? Sure, they wanted victory in the war, but they fought to get home. Home represented everything good in the world. And for a lot of those folks, home meant women. And so early in the war, the American Red Cross made plans to send home to the boys at the front in the form of 6,000 Red Cross volunteers like Gretchen Schuyler. These women went every, to every theater of the war. Um, they went all over the world. They served coffee and donuts. They danced countless dances. They mended some hearts. They might have broken a few others. Um, and Gretchen and her group supervised um, some club mobiles that followed the American invasion um, of Normandy and then followed Patton's Third Army as they moved through France, maybe even serving some donuts to Jose Williams. Um, this was tough work, right? For women who had been enlisted to symbolize home, they served far from it. 
and they did all kinds of work and had all kinds of experiences that they would not have had at home. It was dangerous, exhausting work, and they loved it. Um, Gretchen loved the work and she looked forward to going home, but she had some trepidation about how she would fit back into what she called polite society. Right? How would she adapt to home after having been to war? As the war came to a close, many Americans expected that post-war life would look a lot like the home they had imagined. And we often think about a return to home, but as we heard in the earlier panel, thank you, Professor Cohen, um, the post-World War II home was a brand new model. Right? This was a new model of young families, of families living apart from extended families like they had done before. And this new model of the family, the nuclear family, was really embraced by a lot of Americans as a bulwark against the communist threat and the newly um, sparked Cold War. Of course, it's an ideal. It's not attainable for many, but this is the standard against which most women were judged. And Red Cross women went on to do many things. Many of them went back home. Many of them had families. They married. They had children. And in this way, Gretchen stood out. Gretchen actually went home and was a professor of physical education at Boston University. She played on the US national women's lacrosse team. She was a decorated athlete. She did not mold back into the image of home that she had represented in the war. Um, even those who did were often separated from others of their generation who had not gone to war. Um, and this was particularly true for a lot of the women who had gone to war, but this experience separated them from a lot of men of their generation who had not been to war. And it's interesting to me to think about this idealized image of home, particularly when we think about all of those women who left the home to work during World War II, right? We often think about these women as Rosie the Riveters, some of which we think of in this very idealized, unrealistic manner, um, some of whom <laughs> conform to the more, more realistic version of Rosie the Riveter. Um, one of these women is Beatrice Morales, a mother of four from San Bernardino, California, who took a job during the war at Lockheed. Um, she, her husband was not so thrilled that she had taken the job. Um, she came home and told him she took the job, and he, she said he hit the roof. Um, he was one of those men that didn't believe in the wife ever working, and he was not thrilled, and he never actually came around to the idea of her working. But Beatrice was determined, um, and she, she loved the work. Um, now, her husband was not all that uncommon. In fact, um, at the beginning of the war, a lot of social workers and so-called experts advised against married women and mothers taking jobs. And even by 1943, in the midst of a national conversation about labor shortages, 70% of married men opposed war work for their wives. That's why we had a propaganda campaign to convince the American public that women workers were necessary for the war effort, that they would continue to look like this, somehow, in a factory, um, and that they were temporary. There was a lot of concern, uh, particularly about mothers going back to the home. Now, before World War II, there were exactly five women who worked at Lockheed. Um, but war wartime demands necessitated hiring new workers, women included. And so when Beatrice Morales entered the workforce at Lockheed, she joined 19 million other women who worked for wages during the war. And the most significant sort of change that the war brought in terms of working women is that for the first time in American history, the majority of working women were married, like Beatrice. Um, on the other hand, Beatrice was in the minority of working women, right? While we think about Rosie the Riveter, the women in the defense industry, the vast majority of women who worked did so in clerical work, sales, um, service work. Only about two in 10 women who worked during the war worked in industry, but those were the coveted jobs because they paid more, they were clean work, they were secure work, they were union jobs, right? Two of 10 women. Um, and these were particularly appealing to women like Beatrice um, and to African-American women who had been excluded from more secure jobs in the past. All of this was a huge change for women like Beatrice. Um, she had not been out much on her own. Um, she seldom traveled without her husband, but every day she took the streetcar to work and she faced what she called a daunting work experience. She said it was exciting and it was scary all at the same time. Um, and she was assigned to rivet P-38s. And on her first day of work, great introduction to work, she was assigned to work with a man who told her that she wasn't worth the money she was paid. 
But that experience made her even more determined to excel. And so she learned basically all of the jobs at Lockheed, worked her way up through the plant, um, and did all of it, all of this exhausting work, and at the end of the day came home to a house full of children. Now, as I said, her husband never really got around to the idea of her working. And so late in the war, when two of her sons became ill, he blamed her, told her it was her fault the boys were sick, and so she left Lockheed to take care of the children. And in that way, she did fit the national pattern, right? Fears of economic decline, as we heard, meant the government wanted all men employed and they needed to keep production high, right? It increased demand for consumer goods. And ironically, all of that demand for consumer goods, for washing machines, for vacuum cleaners, led women right back into employment. So initially, while the percentage of women workers dropped at the end of the war, within a few years, there were more women working than had worked during the war. Only now, they were in pink collar jobs, right? They were in less secure, less unionized, less stable, lower paying jobs. And Morales was one of those women. Um, she was never satisfied to be back at home, and as soon as those two boys were better, she started looking for work again. But she was unfulfilled in all of the work that she found. Um, finally, in 1951, in the middle of the Korean War, with wartime industry again at Lockheed pumping up, she was able to get back on at Lockheed, where she stayed until she retired in 1978. Um, and throughout the war, she found great satisfaction in her work. She described herself before the war as just the mother of four kids, that's all. But I felt proud of myself and felt good that I could do something. And being that it was war, I felt I was doing my job. Another woman who was doing her job was Jean Holm, who joined the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps in July 1942, barely two months after it had been formed. And when she left for basic training at Fort Des Moines, Iowa, it was the first time she had left the Pacific Northwest. Um, as she recalled, she was given three options in basic training. She could become a clerk typist, and she had no intention of learning how to type. She could become a cook or a baker, and she didn't plan to spend the war behind a stove. Or she could be in the motor transport. So off to motor transport school she went, where she was selected for officer candidate school. Any of those three options were pretty radical for women at the time, because until World War II, women were only permitted to join the military as nurses. Women had served in other capacities in earlier wars, but had done so mostly as civilians and only in temporary roles, not as members of the military. So as you look at 1939, 1940, even 1941, as the US military prepares for the war, every proposal to create women's auxiliary corps met fierce resistance in Congress, on the Amer from the American public, from all sectors of the American society. It was only the attack on Pearl Harbor that forced Congress to acquiesce. In the wake of the creation of women's corps, hundreds of thousands of women joined the women's units that followed, and each of them was a volunteer. Holm herself understood the his historical significance of what she was doing. She said, we felt like pioneers. We knew we were breaking new ground. But the laws that established the corps ended at six months at the, after the war's end, and so immediately the military moved to demobilize the vast majority of these women, Holm included, who enrolled in uh, college with her GI Bill. But again, the Cold War is heating up almost immediately, and the military knew they needed women's corps again. But again, even with all of, the, all of the service of women in World War II, even with Eisenhower, even with Nimitz coming out in support of these women's corps, it took Congress two years to approve the Women's Armed Services Integration Act, which finally allowed women to serve in the regular military on a permanent basis. It was a profound moment in the history of women in the military, and it's one of the most direct, like absolutely direct, significant um, consequences of World War II for women's history. After the bill passed, Holm got a postcard in the mail asking her if she wanted to join up again. Um, and so she joined the Army, served for about a year, and then switched to the Air Force, the newly created Air Force, where she began a long career um, that ended in 19, well, it, eventually she became the, the director of the Women Air Force in 1965. Now it's the mid-60s. Um, and she said, that's when I made a long list of things I thought ought to be changed. I went to work on the very first day. Holm fought determinedly and often alone to make changes for women in the military. She fought to eliminate the caps on the numbers of women who could serve, the brass ceiling on the ranks they could achieve, to expand the jobs women could perform, 
allow women in ROTC, in the academies. She fought all of those battles, and she led the way. 1971, 29 years after she joined the military in World War II, she was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General. She was the third woman to hold that rank. And a couple years later, she was promoted um, again and was the first woman to wear two stars in the US military. She said she never dreamed of that possibility. In 1942, I thought I might be lucky to be a buck sergeant, she later laughed. Following her retirement, she continued to advocate for women in uniform, and her work and her impact is evident today in the opportunities available to all service women. Not every woman who participated in World War II had such a direct legacy in the post-war post -war world as did General Holm, but World War II showed us ordinary people doing extraordinary things, as they like to say at the museum. And sometimes, what was extraordinary was the ordinary. It was the day-to-day -day work of ordinary women who knew the significance of their work, even if others didn't, and even if many didn't like it. Women show us that war's legacies are complex. World War II both opened and closed doors for women, but perhaps more importantly, it also changed women, like Gretchen Schuyler, Beatrice Morales, and Jean Holm, on an individual basis. And those personal transformations could not be limited or retracted or put back in a box at the war's end. The combination of millions of personal transformations like those ultimately made the world we know today. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Kara. And then we'll wrap up with David's presentation. Thank you. It's an honor to be on this panel, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. A uh, big thank you to the World War II Museum, everybody involved with the symposium, Connie and Jeremy really helping out a lot. Um, my book, Wheels of Courage, uh, came out, oh, I guess I should use this, shouldn't I? Yeah. Uh, my book, Wheels of Courage, whoops, one more. Let's go back one. Uh, my book, Wheels of Courage, came out during the pandemic, so as you can tell, this is the first time I'm presenting in front of a live audience. So excuse my errors, et cetera, but uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, so as I said, my book um, tells a long forgotten story of the first wheelchair athletes. Okay, the paralyzed veterans of World War II were the first cohort of paraplegics to survive, to live a normal lifespan. Thanks to the advent of penicillin, uh, the production of which was ramped up f during World War II, right before and during, and uh, medical and surgical advances at the front lines and uh, at the VA hospitals afterwards. Um, put another way, if you were wounded or pa and paralyzed during World War I, chances are you would be dead within about 18 months. And it was not so much because of the initial injury, uh, the bullet or shrapnel or whatever, um, it was because there was sepsis, uh, uh, bed sore, infections from bed sores, that sort of thing. And also, frankly, uh, apathy and ignorance from the medical community who ne had never been able to deal with this. Um, paraplegics in those days were labeled dead enders, no hopers. Um, there were no such things as ramps, kneeling buses, handicapped parking spaces. Um, so let's take a look at this. Um, uh, oops, uh oh, I hit the wrong button. Yeah, there we go. Um, so take a look at this vintage wheelchair back in the day. These chairs were decidedly not built for mobility or accessibility. Solid wood, heavy metal. They weighed up for more than 100 pounds. Uh, check out those large wheels in the front. They allowed for very little mobility. And you couldn't fold these chairs up. Uh, you, you couldn't have access. There were, you certainly couldn't play sports with them. And uh, these were really for institutions or private homes. Most people, they were pushed on those uh, wheelchairs. Uh, let's take a look at a, a, a very, very rare photo of President Roosevelt. Now, in a wheelchair here, this is at, at his home. Um, uh, FDR, of course, had polio as a young man, 
and, but he very, very seldom allowed himself to be photographed in a wheelchair or to appear in public, as you all know. Why? Largely because of the stigma of pe that people with disabilities faced, certainly in that era. Um, there were so-called ugly laws. They banned people with severe disabilities from appearing in public, and this was in U.S. cities and elsewhere. FDR knew that disability, symbolized by his wheelchair, was considered a sign of weakness. And so that's why whenever you see him, um, he would have aides or his sons to support him. Um, obviously, this is the anniversary of Pearl Harbor. His famous speech, uh, his infamy speech on the floor of the Congress, he's wearing heavy braces that support him so he can stand up. And again, just didn't want to allow himself to be seen as a sign of weakness. Um, so, man, I got it. it's just green. That's the only difference. <laughs> so my book follows three US veterans who were paralyzed during World War II. And for the purposes of my talk today, I'm just going to spotlight one gentleman, uh, Jerry Gene Fessenmeyer. Um, and I was honored and, uh, to meet him. And he was one of my sources in the, when I wrote the book went down to visit him at his place in Texas, and we ended up speaking on the phone several times a month, um, not about military anything, just about what his life was and my life was, and he tried to sweet talk <laughs> my uh, girlfriend on the phone every time. Uh, thanks, Jerry. Um, anyway, he told me he was an Iowa farm boy. He enlisted uh, at the age of 17. He needed his parents' permission. He told me he ran off the stage at his high school graduation, catch a bus to Camp Pendleton, and uh, for basic training with the Marines. Um, Gene was assigned to carry a bar, a Browning automatic rifle, with the 3rd Battalion of the 1st Marine Division. He told me he was being trained for the invasion of the Japanese home islands. Um, of course, before that happened, he was involved in the invasion and takeover of Okinawa. And I'm sure many of you know the brutality there, heavy casualties on both sides. Uh, Gene was shot near Shuri Castle uh, by a Japanese sniper using a Nambu semi-automatic. Uh, Fessy's been hit is the last thing he remembered hearing, and then he was unconscious. He woke up inside a makeshift operating tent on the beach. He could hear the surgeons telling him He's, he might be paralyzed, and he had no idea what that word meant. He had never seen anybody in a wheelchair. Um, he was then transported to a medical ship offshore, taken to Hawaii for a little rest and recuperation, and then flown to the mainland. At that time, he weighed about 70 pounds. He told me that the other veterans on the ward took bets as to whether he would survive or die. Um, uh, but World War II was a game changer. Uh, Gene and many others survived thanks to the care of innovative doctors like Dr. Donald Monroe at Framingham VA, uh, sorry, um, Cushing VA Hospital in Framingham, Massachusetts. And that's him uh, with the bow tie leaning over. Um, he and other spinal cord injury specialists, and including most prominently Dr. Ludwig Gutmann, um, who was in England. He escaped the Nazis. He was Jewish. He escaped the Nazis right before the war and went to England. They espoused a new, a new holistic philosophy on the treatment of paraplegics, treating each patient as an individual and tending to his unique needs. And just a quick aside, and I go into this in the book about spinal cord injury. Of course, everybody knows the spinal cord, how important that is in our, in our, on our bodies. Um, but the, the different wounds, different places, if you're, if you're injured high up on, on your neck area, that's going to have much more damaging effects, perhaps, than something down below. So you had all these different, and, and the spinal cord being such a, a conduit to other parts of the body, um, you had several specialists dealing with this. You had a urinary specialist, perhaps, a kidney specialist, all of these people working. The nurses themselves, and you see the nurse there, um, were vital, 24-7 care for these men. And they were segregated in their own paraplegia ward. Um, and uh, you can't see it on that picture, but they, they invented a new bed that would rotate 
so that they, they would actually be upside down, but that was to alleviate and make sure that they wouldn't have bed sores, because those were, those were the things that would lead to disease, et cetera. Um, they also, the doctors and the, and the staff, they work really hard to boost morale, okay, to counter the stigma of this suicide, of disability. Remember, Gene and others were young men, okay, in the prime of their lives. They had sacrificed their bodies for our country, and now they're faced with fear, doubt, what? Many were distraught. Could they hold down a job? Could they have a wife? Uh, or could they find a, a, a spouse? Um, what about having children? Would you be able to? Um, essentially, what the doctors were preaching was hope, healing. Your life isn't over. With the new drugs and treatments, and actually the support of VA government, and remember, in the early days after the war, the head of the VA was Omar Bradley, appointed by, by Truman, right? Um, so you can go back to school on the GI Bill um, and become a lawyer, businessman. Um, Arte Bulova, as in the watches, he opened up a watchmaking school in New York City for paralyzed veterans to learn the craft of watchmaking and watch repair, which was a, a vital uh, uh, industry back then. And they also played wheelchair basketball there, the Bulova watchmakers, a very, very good team. They also encouraged the men to organize themselves. And they did so. They formed the Paralyzed Veter Veterans of America, PVA, which still exists today and is a, a massive force um, a, a based in DC, but chapters all over. Um, so this is basically the beginning of a new branch of medicine, rehabilitation medicine. For the first time, doctors and physical therapists encourage paraplegics to get out of bed and exercise. Working up a sweat, they found, not only improved one's body, but also the mental makeup. And you can see these exercises. It's about strengthening the neck, the shoulder, the arms, which are so vital for someone who's lost the use of their legs. Um, and that soon led to competition. And this is a photo, historic photo, 1946, one of the first ever wheelchair basketball teams this is in Birmingham VA Hospital in Van Nuys, California. Um, they formed this team called the Flying Wheels. Um, they followed quickly by the team in Cushing and then all over. As paralyzed veterans at the other VAs heard about this, um, they formed their own teams, organized games, leagues, et cetera. Uh, one of the gentlemen I wrote about is on that team, Stan Denadel. He went back to UCLA earned his MBA, one of the first MBA students there, and uh, was a hugely successful businessman for, B for Bank of America. Um, just want to check out those wheelchairs. See, the, those big wheels are in the back. Those are made of aluminum, 45 pounds. And the backs are, are made of fabric. And so it was easy to fold and maneuver and accessibility. And la last point to make on this, basketball was the perfect sport for wheelchair athletes. Uh, it's a smooth surface. It's big enough to contain 10 players. Um, and they could start moving and, mo and moving fast. And um, they also fought to keep the baskets at 10 feet, which was sort of a symbolic way. That's the normal regulation. But they fought to keep that. They didn't want it to bring down as if, oh, we can't manage that. Um, and as part of my research, I shot baskets in a wheelchair. And I can tell you, it's very difficult until you get that practice. Uh, and here's Dr. Goodman in England. He, he, this is his first games. He's using archery as a way uh, of sport. And again, helping the neck and shoulders and arm muscles. Um, and here's uh, Gene Fessenmeyer. He's the one on the far right wearing number one, smiling uh, with the basketball. And he ended up at the Corona Naval Hospital um, in Southern California. Um, and they played on, he played on one of the first wheelchair basketball teams. That's the Rolling Devils. <laughs> okay. Another gentleman I wrote about is the one at the V. That's John Winterhaller, a, a legendary athlete in Wyoming. He was captured on Corregidor, and uh, he lost the use of his legs because of malnutrition and lack of medical care in the POW camps, unfortunately. Um, so when this team traveled to the Bay Area, um, they, they played an able-bodied team called the Bittners, with the one on the 
the right. Um, and these were fundraisers for the PVA, to, at, which would fund research on paraplegia and also serve as an outreach to other paralyzed veterans. Um, these games generated enormous attention. And I think it speaks to, uh, we're talking about this theme of coming home today. These, these gentlemen came home, and they came home to media attention. People wanted to help them, to help them with their medical issues. Um, uh, President Truman, of course, was a World War I veteran. Um, he initiated the National Employee the Handicap Week as early as 1945. Um, again, I mentioned Omar Bradley. And it, and it also fits in, by the way, with leisure time. This is starting in the late 40s, 50s. What is America, what is, no, what is most normal? Leisure. And, and that's what these gentlemen are. Um, that's Newsweek, of course, 1948. This is after a historic game at Madison Square Garden between two groups of paralyzed veterans. Uh, sold out Madison Square Garden. And that's Jack Gerhardt uh, that you see on the cover. Um, and you see his uniform, PVA, right? And that's the other wrinkle to this story. Um, whenever the flying, these are the flying wheels from Van Nuys that I mentioned. So whenever these teams would barnstorm the nation, which they did every year, um, they would stop in Washington, D.C. and lobby for disability rights. Here they are at the Capitol. You can see the woman behind them. That's Congresswoman Edith Norse Rogers, who is a major force behind the GI Bill, right? Um, Here's the national champion flying wheels meeting with President Eisenhower in the White House, mid-1950s. And they won. Congress passed a car allowance, which enabled them to purchase specially adaptive cars with hand levers and gears instead of pedals. They also won a housing allowance. They, they weren't, had money to build a, houses that were accessible with ramps, widened doorways, and lowered bathrooms and kitchens. So the, the legacy of the paralyzed veterans of World War II is multifold. Um, they were really the first uh, uh, people with disability to appear in public, to be visible, and to be proud of who they were. Um, they also were the leading one of the leading forces with disability rights, leading to the passage of the ADA, 1990, signed by World War II veteran President George H.W. Bush. Um, and as I said, they were one of the first people to compete at sports at the Para, para Olympics, Paralyzed Veterans Olympics. So that starts really in 48 with Dr. Goodman. And I'm, I'm getting to the end of this. Um, eventually, sports, with, sports for people with disability expanded beyond the veterans community. Um, and in the 60s, you had women and children starting to enter the force. And, and starting to compete. That photo is taken from the 1984 Olympics, and that was a, a woman who was with the University of Illinois. She was an athlete from the University of Illinois, which was a hotbed of, of wheelchair sports for various reasons. Um, and I'll close with this quote, um, and you can read it from Dr. Howard Rusk, who was one of the fathers of rehabilitation medicine, and it speaks to the irony of the destructive forces of war and yet it, how it sparks a medical revolution. So thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Right, so thank you to our panelists. And I'm actually going to follow the lead of Dr. Hitchcock earlier, where I have a million questions that I could ask. But instead, I want to make sure that all of you have time to ask questions. And I'm just going to offer briefly two observations that I think can tie everything together. And actually, it's not really hard to tie all these papers together. One of the great things about the Liberation Pavilion, but also studying World War II's impact on some of these movements, is that they're not single movements. In a lot of ways, there is a lot of overlap. You can't have one without the other. So I appreciated, David, your PowerPoint, where you mentioned how important nurses were, which builds off of Kara's paper about the importance of women. And then you also have the tie-in to black 
veterans who come home after the war to really initiate some change. So I would challenge everyone in here to not think of these things as different strands, but to think of how World War II made it possible for them to work together. It's very difficult to pull different movements out and look at them as one thing. They're actually very much connected. And I also really appreciated the different individual personal experiences that all the panelists brought up these personal transformations and how they came together into this bigger narrative. Because there is a long civil rights movement. If you haven't heard of that, this is something that a lot of historians talk about. That it's not that these movements began during or after World War II. There had been people pushing for change for quite some time. But there is something really special about World War II and how you see these different experiences, different regions pulled together into a bigger movement. And I just want to close on something that Kara had brought up, and that is sometimes the ordinary is really extraordinary. And I think all of the panelists here today gave you some idea of how that actually worked and why World War II and the legacy is so important for understanding some of the changes that came after. So I want to turn it over to you now to ask our panelists some really great questions. So thank you. We will start in the back to your right, if I can figure out how to get there. Hi. I was just wondering if, um, Mr. Davis, if you are aware, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright designed a home for a World War II vet who was paralyzed in Rockford, Illinois. And um, I was just there for a tour not too long ago. I just thought that was very interesting. It was completed in 1952, and it was designed so that anybody who came there would be, be seated at the veterans level. Um, I would just thought, I just wondered if you were aware of it. I, I am aware of it, I, and I, I tried to fit it into the uh, narrative of the book, which, which I was unable to, but, but yeah, it was a, a that um, veteran, was savvy enough to hire one of the most famous architect in the world uh, to, to design a, an accessible home. And, it, and it, I've seen the photos of that, and it, it is particularly fabulous. But that housing allowance that the men earned um, and, and was passed by Congress, most of the people, I guess like everybody else, was just building in the suburbs. Um, they, they had a, this was in, in I'm, I live in Southern California, but in the San Fernando Valley, there would be pockets of areas that were, you know, sort of a cul-de-sac of paralyzed veterans, in part so they could be near a, a VA hospital, um, so that if they would need medical attention. And then, of course, that, that medical center I talked about in Van Nuys, they moved it abruptly to Long Beach, California, and a lot of veterans were very upset about that. Um, so, but thank you for raising that. That's one of the, that's an amazing example of accessibility. Next question is to your left in the very front row, far left, please. A uh, comment and a question for David. Uh, first of all, I find it a little bit ironic that three future U.S. senators, uh, Phil Hart, Daniel Inoue, and Bob Dole, both all were in the same rehab hospital at the same time, and I'm sure that they were major forces for legislation that happened down the road. But my question is, to what extent did movies play a role in disability? I'm thinking of two movies, The Greatest Years of, of Our Life with Harold Russell, yes. uh, an amputee, and then The Men with Marlon Brando in his first role. Can, can you comment on that? Yes, um, and I, I devote a whole chapter in the book to The Men. Um, which is sort of the dark side of the, the greatest years, the best years of our lives. And he was an amp the, the gentleman, uh, best years of our lives, famous, won all sorts of Oscars. Um, he was an amputee, and uh, he, he was actually, he lost the use of his hands in a training accident uh, before the war, or I mean during the war, but in a training accident. That was, and, and people know, have seen that movie, I'm sure, very famous, and it ends in sort of this very light, everybody gets married, everybody gets the girl, and it's, it's a very happy ending. Um, the dark side is this movie called The Men, and that was filmed on location at Birmingham VA Hospital in Van Nuys. 
and Marlon Brando. It was his first starring role after he was in the starring in on Broadway. This was the first role that he did. He trained in a wheelchair. He hung out with the guys, drank, and and got into all sorts of trouble in Hollywood with them. Um, but that is a that's actually a very dark movie, and it shows. Uh, you know, he doesn't want to take part in the exercises, and, and he's sort of close to suicidal. Um, then he does take part. He, gets, he plays wheelchair basketball in the, in the uh, film. Um, he gets married, I th maybe to a nurse. I can't remember. Um, or maybe it was, yeah. Anyway, but he gets married, but the, but the marriage uh, um, is rocky. And um, it, 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 it's worth trying to find out. It's on DVD if you, if you can find it. It's, it's a very... Uh, intense experience watching it. Thank you for your question. Next question is going to be to your left. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm a retired physician who did a lot of rehabilitation medicine in my day, and I found that the, one of the most difficult things is not medical and it's not uh, physical. It's providing hope to these patients. Did you find that giving them the goal of playing in sports, participating in sports, helped stimulate that sense of hope? Absolutely, absolutely. I knew I mean, that. It's it's a I, <laughs> no. It's a it's a, it, it, what I was trying to speak to was it, it was trying to get these men to consider what is a quote unquote normal life, and that includes vocation. There was a lot of vocation training at these VA hospitals, but a lot of it was hey let's let's play a game, let's play sports. And if you're a young guy in your twenties, I mean. What would you be doing? You'd be home playing basketball or softball or bowling or whatever. And by the way, they, all of these sports became adaptive sports. You can, play, you, can ski, you can do any sport now in a wheelchair or with whatever disability. So yeah, it was very much working, working with their psyche, working with their minds. Um, and I think it was just much more difficult back then because these were the path breakers. They were the first cohort to move on. So I, I think the doctors and so forth had uh, a, a big work, um, and you know they, they wanted to do tough love. That was their philosophy. Come on, you guys, let's do it. And one last thing, and I hope there's other questions here for the other panelists. I don't want to hog this, but one, one last thing. A lot of these men, and this is what, what Gene would tell me and, and so forth, a lot of these men, the veterans, the paralyzed veterans, would come home and go, you know what, I'm still alive. I, I left a lot of friends, et cetera, in Okinawa or wherever. I'm still here. I'm going to make the most of this. And I can tell you that Gene lived to the ripe old age of 90 with three marriages, et cetera. <laughs> and one of our last conversations, he was, he was negotiating to buy the property across the street from him. I'm like, what are you doing, Gene? You're 90, man. Come on. Next question is in the center aisle to your right. Uh, Dr. Cox, I'd like to know more about your grandfather. I know you said he was in the Pacific. Um, I'd like to know where he was stationed, what kind of work he did, what rank he achieved, and what he was like later on in life when you were just a youngster. Please tell us about him. Yeah, 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 sure. So, so yeah, he, he was in an engineering battalion, um, and th his job was to uh, build runways. Um, and, uh, um, and often I would ask him, you know, did he see combat or whatever, um, and, and I guess he did see combat because the, the Japanese would, would, would routinely um, attack, um, the, the, you know, try to blow up the runways as they were building it, and then they would go back and they would build it. Um, and so uh, he was at Guadalcanal, he was at New Caledonia, um, and uh, uh, that's, that was the, the, where pretty much his service during World War II. Um, um, after um, World War II, he was stationed uh, in Germany, um, and, uh, um, and he, he, he served there for a while. They lived in France. Um, I think he was at, um, trying to remember the, uh, the, the post over in New York. Um, um, but they were in New York, and then he, he pretty much, you know, spent most of his career moving around a lot. Um, and, uh, and after he retired, he, uh, he went back to uh, Louisiana and uh, worked at Southern University where he started a janitorial business. Uh, and me and my brothers, um, we, we weren't asked to work, we were told. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to work and um but it was really cool because at the age of 13 we had social security cards and we had jobs and and, and he paid us with a check 
I mean, you, you've got to check just like everybody else in line. Um, but he, he instilled a lot of um, work values um, in me and my brothers. Um, and, 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 and his military experience and in, and in terms of how he was viewed just within my family, it really, really encouraged me to want to know more about the black experience. Um, and why African Americans would fight so hard um, to be in the military, but to be frank with you, to fight for a nation that didn't really want them. Um, one of the things that I, I forgot to sort of mission, mention that I did want to mention that many of those individuals that I ran through very quickly because the time goes by so fast up here. I got to do a much better job of watching that, 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 that <laughs> clock. Um, the, many of these individuals, I was very impressed. Like Jose S. Williams, he had a master's degree in chemistry. Um, Robert Brown got a PhD at Berkeley, um, uh, University of California, Berkeley. I mean, many of these military veterans who did come back and, and take leadership roles in the Civil Rights movement, movement were very well educated, especially for that particular time, but even for right now. Um, so you, you see this effort of not only wanting to make their, their local communities better, but also pursuing educational uh, opportunities and, and, and encouraging um, those, that access for, for African Americans, but also just um, people who were disenfranchised. Um, and so uh, as, as I was doing research and I've even interviewed different individuals, I always come to a point where I, I either hear or read that they point out that their military service uh, encouraged them to come back and make the world a better place, starting with their local communities. And, and I think um, that, that, that is, is, is a residual of, of uh, uh, World War II, um, but also I see that as this new world order and how, how the war really impacted many, many lives. Um, I, I really appreciated the, um, the comments that uh, Rob Hutchinson made earlier today when he talked about how the Cold War was very impactful to the civil rights movement. Uh, I would often tell my students when I taught at the Citadel Military College that I don't think there would be a civil rights movement without the Cold War and World War II that literally what was happening in the United States in terms of lynching and disenfranchisement, the Russians would use that as propaganda throughout the world, but in particular in Africa, in Asia, in South America, where these are colored nations, and say, look, the United States, they're hypocrites. You know, look what they're doing to African Americans, so this is what they would do to you. This literally prompted Eisenhower, Truman, and other leaders to say, wait, wait a minute, you know, national security is very, very important, but we also need to make sure that what's happening at home doesn't impact us negatively around the world. And so again, the Cold War and World War II have a, a, a instrumental, profound impact on the civil rights movement. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, I'm gonna take the floor moderator's prerogative. Kara, there are two stories that I love telling here. One is one of my favorite earliest volunteers uh, was a woman Marine, one of the earliest uh, females to serve in the Marine Corps. And she said that uh, the, the biggest blowback she experienced personally were from civilian women. And uh, those that she joined with were all sisters, uh, but those back home really looked at them sideways. Uh, the other is one of our best oral histories talks, uh, it's a woman who worked in a factory and she talks about how it was great and we did our part and everybody loves it and we can put it on all of our promotional fundraising videos. And she says, and then when it was over, we all wanted to go back home to the kitchen. Not exactly the message we wanted to reach, but can you talk about uh, this, this pushback? You know, we, th we see it as a push forward from World War II, but what challenges did they find um, during the war, but also to revert back to their traditional roles? Yeah, no, that's a great question because, uh, you know, I think what a, a lot of our students want to hear is that all of these new opportunities popped up for women, right? They sort of sprang up out of the earth fully formed somehow. And at the end of the war, we just keep going with it. And that would make a really nice story, only there is a lot of pushback. Um, and there's a lot of concern, and it's coming from the top down, um, economic concerns on the part of the government that we need full employment, and that meant men. And so we have to push all of these women out of industry jobs to make room for men um, who are coming home. And so part of that resistance is an economic concern, part of it's a cultural concern. Um, but a lot of the women you know, it's interesting that um, you always hear there's one woman who's like, I really just wanted to go home and bake cookies. And maybe that's true, right? Working during the war, 
managing a home in an era in which housework, generally for middle class folks, was about 50 hours of labor a week in 1940. Balancing these jobs is not easy. And so for some women, going back home was great. <laughs> it's like, please let me go home. Um, but for most women who worked, they worked because they had to. Um, they worked because they needed the money, and they worked as, after the war because they needed the money as well. Um, and so the, that spark that the war created, and sort of opening their eyes to, yes, I can do this. Yes, I can balance these two roles. Yes, I can balance my checkbook. <laughs> I can balance my checkbook that has my money in it. Um, those sorts of transformations don't go away as easily um, at the war's end. And I think that's where um, thinking about the legacy of World War II for women in particular, we have to take a really wide frame. Um, that change isn't an event, it's a process. Um, it's something that happens over decades, over generations, um, and that happens one person at a time. Well, we have a question to your right towards the front. Oh, thanks, thanks to all of you for your excellent presentations. Um, I joined the Navy in 1968, uh, and I, my, the legislation under which I joined is that 1947 uh, uh, act. And it always struck me that uh, the women in the military, particularly in the post-1947 period, we were kind of left out of the women's movement. Uh, on our legislation in the Navy, particularly, uh, women were not allowed to serve in combat. So because every Navy ship is considered a combat, that meant that until 1992, when the law was re repealed, uh, we were not allowed to serve in any sea duty assignments except for hospital ships. Um, so uh, could you comment, either Kara or uh, anybody else, could you comment about the fact that uh, women in the military in the post-war period were really at least in my judgment, left out of the civil rights side of it, the pressure to uh, uh, allow us to be full participating members of the military. Yeah, that's a great question, Marty. Um, Admiral Evans, by the way, um, a legacy of Gene Holmes' efforts in many ways. Um, you know, we tend to separate in the historiography the women in the military and the women's movement. Um, and one of the reasons I picked Jean Holmes to talk about is because she really bridges the two. Um, and she fought actively against, um, honestly, other women in the military um, who had come up during World War II, faced a lot of resistance and a lot of criticism um, against women in uniform, and came out of that war with the mentality that we have to protect women, um, that we have to be very conservative and very traditional in what we advocate for, because that's the only way we're going to survive, and it's the only way we're going to keep women in uniform. And Jean Holm was different. And she fought against the other women leaders, the WAC and the women Marines. She fought against all of them. Um, and she said, no, it has to be different. Um, and by her era, by the time she's promoted to general, by the time um, General Hayes, General Hoisington are promoted, they're finally starting to make those connections. And they're starting to push for things like, you shouldn't have to be um, discharged when you have children at home, right? If we're not discharging single fathers, Jean Holm said, why are we discharging mothers? Um, why can't you have a marriage and a family? Why doesn't your husband receive de dependency benefits the same as a wife does? Um, she's the one who fought for that. Um, and she's the one who I think really started to help people see that the women's movement and women in the military had a lot in common. Um, and that really kind of blossomed with the, with the Equal Rights Amendment in the early 70s um, and kind of grew from there. So that's a great question, thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, Steph Hennerschitz, Marcus Cox, Kara Vuick, and David Davis, round of applause, please.